look at what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 2. This is our base, um, the base verses for this series of Jesus is. And the word of God says this. You'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus, say with me, first Jesus. Say it again, first Jesus. Say it for a third time so your heart can hear it. Say, first, Jesus, and who he is, then Jesus, and what he did, Jesus crucified. Jesus is the topic. Jesus is it. We preach Jesus. Can someone say amen? I've so enjoyed preaching on or learning about the attributes of Jesus. And I could literally feel in my soul and my heart how we as a church in these past couple of weeks have grown in our understanding. Not only in that understanding of our minds, but actually the understanding of our heart of who Jesus is for me. Who Jesus is to me. And we've been learning about Jesus being our best friend. Say with me, best friend. He gets us. That was the first message in this Jesus series. He gets us. He understands all we go through, think and suffer. He understands our daily struggles and our temptations because the word says, the Bible says, that Jesus became 100% man. He, he was here. He felt hunger. He felt anger. He felt frustration. He, he, he cried when his friend um, Lazarus, he knew that he had died. He was with us. And the Bible says he was tempted in everything. Everything means everything. Like there is nothing left out. He was tempted in everything, but yet he was without sin. We learned last week. So that was two weeks ago. And last week we learned that Jesus is our teacher. Say teacher. So not only does he get us, but then he teaches us. We can hear through his teachings what he wants us to do. We can see by his example because he not only talked the talk, he walked the walk. So he not only talked about forgiveness, he walked out forgiveness. His greatest, one of his greatest examples to me, one of the greatest examples of forgiveness or or of compassion or of love for people was him hanging on the cross and yet asking the Father for forgiveness for those who had put him there. Like, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine being in a situation of suffering and then just asking God and knowing that those who put me there and knowing that those who talked about me and knowing that those who had pointed me out were there and asking God, Lord, forgive them. Forgive them because they know not what they do. No, I'm more of the type of person I'm like, let them pay, Lord. Right? I want your justice. Because when we're on the other side of the coin, we're like, we want right justice for them, but grace for us. Come on, come on. You came to a hot church. We're honest, open, and transparent here. I don't know about you, but I don't have wings and I don't fly around my house. Right? So it's like when when you're going through stuff, we can look at Jesus and we can see the example of being not only preaching, not only teaching about being servants to each other, serving each other, but yet he actually got on his knees and washed the feet of his disciples. And that might not seem like a big deal to you, but remember there was a Judas in that group. And he knew that he was the one that was going to give him over. He was the one that was going to betray him. But yet he didn't say like, oh, let me start with you and then let me go with you. Oh, no, I'm going to skip over you because you're going to betray me. Right? I don't know how many of you would have washed the feet of the person that was going to betray you, but he did. So the Bible tells us that when we, when Jesus saw the needs of the people, that he felt compassion. That he felt compassion for them. He was not angered. He was not frustrated. He was not like, oh my gosh, look at them. They're so human. No, he taught out of compassion. And why? Because he saw that we were lost. 
He saw that we were making the wrong decisions. He saw that we were trying to, to make our way, to earn our way into heaven. And he saw that we were failing. And he didn't say like, oh my gosh. He didn't criticize. He came and he taught. Not only did he teach by saying, not only did he teach by example, he led us. He took us and he takes us by the hand. You know, when Gregory and Cindy were doing the transition today and they were talking about sometimes having to turn off, I so identify. I feel like Gregory and I have a lot of the same personality in some way or another, even though he's not like, ah, like me, right? But he's there. It's hidden there somewhere. Um, but, you know, most of the time when I'm driving in the car, I'm the type of person that instead of putting music, I turn it off. I turn it off because I like to have that that quiet time, I like to, he like, hear, I, I want to hear God. And mostly when you're driving in traffic, like, you need to hear God or you're going to hear the devil. Right, you guys? <laughs> it's like, you're like, kill him, kill him. No, 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 help me, Holy Spirit. But, you know, Elijah, when he was praying for rain, when he was praying for rain, it actually says, the word of God says, that he put his head between his legs. So if you can imagine that, here, can you help me? Can you help me demonstrate it? Do you think you could help me? Could you do that for me? Because I think it just, it wouldn't look good because I'm wearing a skirt today. So you're, you're going to get down, so you're praying for rain, but you're going to put your head between your knees. And I wonder in this, in, in this position what he was doing. Was it that it's just more spiritual? And say it wasn't that way. Say now you get on your, get on your knees like you're praying because that was kind of the position. But he didn't just pray, like, he actually put his head all the way between his knees. Can you do it? Can you be a pretzel? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Give him a, a round of applause. Why did I want you to see that? Because a lot of times the voices around us get so loud that we really need to put ourselves in that type of position to say, Heavenly Father, like, I need to hear you. Like, I came to hear you. I, don't, I, I know what so-and-so has the opinion of this. I know what this other person says. But right now, at this moment, like Elijah, I'm praying for rain. I'm praying for something impossible. I'm praying for something that hasn't happened in a long time. I'm praying for something that there's not even evidence of. But right now, I not only need to hear you, I need to know it's you. I'm putting my head between my knees, right? Not physically, you guys, not physically. Don't go home and like, I'm going to do this, right? It's not about the position. It's about Jesus. It's about the position of your heart. It's about Focusing on Jesus. And that's what I love about this third part. That Jesus is our shepherd. Say our shepherd. Not only is he our shepherd, the word says he is our good shepherd. I'm going to show you in the word of God where it says this. So John 10.10 10 says something that we all know, but yet we act surprised. It says the devil or the thief comes only to steal, steal and kill and destroy. Only. Like if that wasn't enough. Right, you guys? So the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Not if he comes, but he will come to do this to your marriage. He will come to do this to your finances. He will come to do this to your family. He will come. If I told you tonight there is going to be a thief coming to your home tonight, guaranteed. There is not a threat, not it might be. It, he is coming. What would you do before you went to bed? Think about it. What would you do? Oh, I would just leave the door open. I would leave all the lights on. I'll leave like if he was Santa, you know, some milk and some cookies. No. What would you do? You know, if you're, if you're anything for your rights to bear arms, I'm sure that you would have it loaded next to your bed, right? And I'm sure not even that. You would be, uh, let's see. Come. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave the lights on. I'm going to be waiting for you. You know that the, the word of God tells us that the, the devil will come? And then when he does, we act surprised. But we've left all the doors open. We've left all the lights on. We've said, oh, yeah, come, come. And then he takes our kids, and we're like, just bring them back in a couple of years. All oh, they're teenagers. They're teenagers. It's a phase. Oh, yeah, devil, take them in their teenage years. Just bring them back later. What? 
Do you notice how this happens? How we allow the devil to come into our homes and to steal, to steal our peace and to steal our children and to steal whatever it is. And then we actually, we actually like give him an excuse. You know, we actually, I, I don't know what the, the word is I'm trying, like we explain. We're like, oh, it's just normal, pastor. It's normal, you know. Marijuana is legal. Everybody's doing it. It's natural. And then you're like, it's natural. I mean, it, it doesn't do anything, anything to me. Okay, you guys. <laughs> Did I make my point? <laughs> the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But that's not the end of the verse. It says, I have come, Jesus speaking. I have come, Jesus has come, so that we might have life and have it to the fullest. And that's not where the verse ends. Not only did he come to give us life and life to the fullest, like life to the, to the max, not a half life, not a half filled life, but life to the fullest. But then he says, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Turn to your neighbor and say, he is good. Jesus is good. Jesus is good. Jesus is good. He's good for you. He's good for your family. He's good. He's not going to later on, he's not gonna, you know, he's not going to cause cancer. He's not going to come and be bad for your health. He's not going to, uh, you know, get you all sick. He's not going to come and put burdens on you. He's good. He is a good shepherd. Jesus is good. In the Bible, we're compared to a family. Not an institution or organization, but a family. Another description of us in the Bible is that we're all part of the body of Christ. We are all part of the body of Christ. Look at your neighbor and ask them, say, what part are you? Because <laughs> we all have a function in the body. I know, I'm definitely the mouth. I am definitely. We all have a part, uh, we have a function in the body and need to be part of the body. We are not observers of the body. We are not observers of the body, but actually integrated participators of the body of Christ. When you come, and I'm not preaching to you, we are all here learning about the word of God. Amen? So another description, and his favorite description is us as the flock and he as the shepherd. This was actually his favorite description he used for himself. He as the shepherd and we as the flock, and more specifically as the sheep. A lot of people get offended. They're like, oh, do not compare me to an animal. Well, stop acting like one. No. But the Bible actually says, and it's not that we're actually sheep, you guys. I'm not trying to offend anyone. I'm a sheep too. But it's what we are, how we, how we, um, the type of relationship we have with Jesus. Psalms 103 says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. The closest English word to shepherd is the word pastor. So yes, we are your pastors and we're called to serve you. But actually over us, leading us, the pastor of pastors, the, the, the head honcho, right? The chief shepherd is Jesus. Say, it's Jesus. It is Jesus. And it says that, that the, the, the pastor would lay his life for his sheep. Do you know that in a, in a sheep pen, in the, in the times of the Bible... It says he is the door, he is the gate. It compares Jesus. Did you know that there was actually not a door? That there was actually not a gate? That the pastor actually laid his body at the opening. Every night when the sheep would come in, first of all, all the sheep would be together. This is, this is the way it was done. But every shepherd had a like a tone or a song or a sound. 
And when the shepherd, when he's like, okay, we got to go. My sheep has have all the sheep are together. And he would like have his call. Babe, do the call that you used to, to, for the girls. Mario, do the call that you used for the girls. Yeah, that's the call. Do it again. Okay, we are at the fashion show mall. Okay, and my Latino husband, right? does that in the middle of the mall as the, the girls are doing the runway show, right? And you just see wherever they are, they're like, mm, dad's calling, dad's calling. And you just see both of my girls and me, we're like, okay, it's time, it's time to come back. Seriously, do you guys have a call? Does anybody else have a call for their family? Yes, okay. So the pastors, that actually was the time of the Bible. The pastors had that call and the sheep... Just the sheep that belonged to that pastor would go with that pastor and then would go into the pen. Then there was not a door. You would think there would be a door because the pastor was the door. See? He laid his life down. He would go and he would lay down at the opening because any wolf that wanted to come into that at that sheep pen had to go through him. Jesus is our pastor. Can someone say, Jesus is my good shepherd? Can someone say amen to that? First Peter 5, 4 actually says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Not only is he a good shepherd, he is the chief shepherd. I love that. I love it because a lot of times we think of Jesus and we think he walked around like floating. I don't know about you, but, and then like with silky hair, right? And he's just like, everything's like peace and love. He wasn't actually that, like that. He was a carpenter. Okay, he was a carpenter. He worked with his hands. Uh, they, they've actually said that he probably was more on the muscular side, you know, rough hands. He was a carpenter. And he hung out with the rough crowd. <laughs> right? But we have this picture of him and we're thinking he's just good and he's just holy. But not only is that, I love the description that says he's the chief shepherd. There is position to that. There's like, you know. There is no other name above the name of Jesus. Can you say amen with me? Amen. So my prayer for you is that you would know Jesus as your pastor, as your shepherd. Psalms 23, 1 to 6, and yes, I'm going to go old school. I'm going to go the new, the, well, I'm going to do new King James Version. But I feel like most of us memorize this verse in the King James Version, right? So it says, the Lord is my, thank you. The Lord is my shepherd. This is David right in the get-go with a statement of dependence. Not independence, not codependence, complete dependence. I am the sheep, you are the shepherd. You know, you tell me, you call me, you direct me, you guide me, Lord. When was the last time that you gave him that authority? When was the last time that you actually told Jesus, oh, he knows, okay, and you, you don't like your spouse to tell you I love you? You don't like your children to say thank you, I love you, mom, I love you, dad? No, you know, but you still should say it. Because there's power in words, there's power in recognition, there's power in those statements. The word of God says that whatever we declare here on earth, will, whatever we, we um, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We have power in our tongue. So he is my shepherd. So there's a three-year-old little boy, right? And he was like being a three-year-old little boy all day long. And his parents were, you know what? We've had enough. You deal with him because when they're bad, one parent will tell the other, deal with your child. Right? When they're good, you're like, oh, my God, did you see my child? He just scored a touchdown. Look at my, my child. He gets it from my side of the family. Oh, yeah, that, my side of the family. All the bad stuff, your side. Okay. So, so right there, she's like, deal with your child. The mom's like, deal with your child. I can't even take this anymore. Sound familiar to anyone? Okay, don't raise your hand. So take him. So they sent him to his room for timeout, okay, for an hour. They said, you are in timeout. Five, 
three-year-old little boy. Five minutes later, he came out with his favorite stuffed toys, his piggy bank, and some clothes, and he was headed for the front door. He was determined. He was like, and he looks back at his parents, and he's like, I'm running away from home. I'm running away from home. He announced, what will you do when you get hungry, his dad asked. I'll come home to eat. And when you run out of money, I'll come home for some more. And what will you do when your clothes get dirty? I'll bring them home and let mommy wash them. The father turned to the mother and said, our kid isn't running away from home. He's going off to college. <laughs> right? You're so grown up because you're moving away to college, but yet you're still dependent. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. Yes, on, on, in this earth, we need to, you know, here on this world, we need to be independent. Yes, those are good things, but not independent from God. We need to depend on God for everything. And God is a good shepherd. Say with me, he's a good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in where? In green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil. Say, I will fear no evil. Turn to your neighbor and say, I will fear no evil. If you find yourself walking through the valley of the shadow of death at this moment, let me tell you, fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Not only are you speaking to me, not only are you leading by example, but you are taking me by the hand and I know you are with me. I'm not imagining that you are with me. I don't have a feeling that you are with me. I know, Lord, because you have me by the hand. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me. The rod and the staff is to defend the first um, uh, Thing that the rod and the staff were made for, yes, they are used to bring back the sheep, but the primary purpose wasn't that. The primary purpose of the staff was to defend the sheep. So that's why we're comforted, because when I can't defend myself, Lord, you have your staff. You're going to defend me. I don't have to defend myself. I don't have to clear things up. Lord, the truth will come out because you are the truth. You are a good shepherd. Say, he is a good shepherd. Amen. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You feed me. You give me a whole, uh, and not whatever, you know, buffet. Uh uh. It's Caesar's Palace. The Bach, what is it called? Whatever. I love it though. So good. So good. And you know what? When you are being nasty to me, when you are trying to do things and spreading rumors, and when people are trying to get after you, you know what God's going to do? The Word of God says He prepares a table before your enemies. So you know that your enemies thought they were bringing you down. You, they thought that they were doing you harm. But let me tell you, God will prepare a table in front of your enemies, before your enemies, in the name of Jesus. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. There is more than enough because you anoint my head. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can someone say amen? Number one, the shepherd provides. Say he provides. I'm going to go really quick. Philippians 4.19, and my God will meet all our needs according to. He provides. He provides. What are you missing? He provides. Have you had a conversation with him? Have you lowered the radio so you can hear him? Have you asked him, oh, no, how can I ask? I've been so bad. Oh, thank God it's not about you. Thank God you don't have to merit it. Thank God that he is a good shepherd. Say, he's a good shepherd. Why do I keep on saying that? Because a lot of times we think he's an angry shepherd. Because a lot of times we think, oh, no, we've been so bad, so he's going to give us what we, we deserve I thank God he doesn't give us what we deserve. I thank God day and night he has not given me what I deserve. He has given me what he wants for me. He has given me from the abundance of his good heart and not from the stinginess of mine. Can someone say amen to that? Yes, he is a shepherd that provides. Number two, he's a shepherd that restores. 
You know that when you have like a piece of furniture and it's already been like wear and tear and it's been used and it's been, but it's like an antique and you're like, I just, you know, I, what can we do? I don't want to throw it away because there's so many memories. There's so many good things. There's so many family dinners that were eaten at this table and it was my grandmother's table and I want to keep this table. He comes and he restores. He takes away all of the bruises. He takes away all of the hurt. He takes away all the wear and tear. He brings it back to life. So whatever came to want to tear you down, let me tell you, the shepherd restores. He restores. He restores your home. He restores your finances in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 2008 was one of the worst years in our economy. Worst years. I hear testimonies. In, our, in Las Vegas was one of the worst markets that was hit with the crisis of 2008. There's stories of how people lost their homes, how banks wouldn't negotiate with them, how they lost and how, you know, they, they had to fight with, with these feelings of being a loser, of, of having just not, you know, not taking care of their family and everything. But you know what? You can't be living in 2008. You have to get over that. You've got to get over that. You've got to move forward. God will restore. And not only does he restore to what it was, he restores to even better. He makes things new. Can someone say amen? The shepherd leads. The shepherd leads. Leading. I want to give you this example. So we're like, oh, yeah, take me by the hand, Lord, right? We're like, okay, you've spoken to me. You're teaching me through your word. You're teaching me through your example. Now you're leading me. I've always noticed that when we're walking through the mall, I love to be romantic. My husband is not as romantic as me, but obviously he does it. He, I could see him trying to be romantic to win me over. And so he knows that when we walk through the mall, I, I love to take his hand. And I love us to walk through the mall, right? And I'm just like, this is so amazing. Yes, we're talking. And then I'm like, and he's like, do you want to go and stop and get a coffee? And I'm like, yes, thank you. Because he knows that coffee is my love language. I'm like, in the vein, in the vein. So he knows that he just says that. And then he's like, okay, so we go and we're talking or whatever. And then something happens. <sighs> when I go next to this place, called the shoe sh section of Nordstrom's. I let go of his hand and I go towards the shoes. I'm like, see you, peace out. And mostly when it's the 60% off sale. Girls, girls, have you been to Nordstrom's? Can I get a hallelujah and an amen? When they have a 60% off sale on boots, Oh my gosh, oh, ra -ba -ba -ba, right? We just start speaking in tongues. So I let go of my husband's hand. So that romantic in me, that, oh, take me by the hand, oh, take me to get some coffee, oh, that I just want to hold your hand and I want us to be all cuddly together. It goes out the door the minute, the minute I see the shoes. You're like, what does that have to do with us? Don't we do that so many times to Jesus? We're like, Jesus, I love you. Lead me. Do that until we want to do what we want to do. Until we're not willing to forgive. That's your shoe, your shoe section. Until you run towards the temptation. Oh, this is so fine. Do you even say that anymore? No? Yeah? Oh, us, because we're, yeah, the same age almost. Right? Until we're tempted with something until something looks better, and you're like, oh, you, you understand, I mean, 60% off. Like, I wanted you to lead me until I saw that, something that interest, interested me even more. You know what, I, I don't want us to have that type of relationship with Jesus. At least I don't want to have that type of relationship with Jesus. I don't want to have the type of relationship where I come to his house, maybe because I'm in need. Maybe because I need comforting, maybe because I just feel empty so I need to be filled. But yet when he fills you, when he comforts you, and you see something else that entices you, we just, we're just so willing to let go of his hand that quickly and run towards our shoe section, right, you guys? The parable of the shoes, the parable of the shoes. But the shepherd leads us. He's always there. Number four, the shepherd supports us. He supports us. Do you feel weak? Do you feel like faint? He supports you. 
but you need to let him lead you to those to those springs of water to those green pastures to get renewed to get restored he supports you second timothy 4 16 says no one came to my support but everyone deserted me but the lord stood at my side and gave me strength you know what let's stop criticizing people because they can't be god in our lives let's stop you know, hating on people because they can't be perfect. I can't be perfect either. No one can be perfect. We're not Jesus. We're not called to be perfect. We're just called to love each other unconditionally like Jesus taught us. But he supports us all the time because he can because he is Jesus. The shepherd defends us. And lastly, the shepherd blesses us. It says, he anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. He anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Oil is blessing. Oil is blessing. Maybe you felt like you've taken Jesus out of the equation. So you're coming to church and you're like, maybe if I go like consistently for three weeks, then I can ask Jesus for his blessing. Let me tell you right now, right here, without even changing one thing, Jesus is here and Jesus is here to bless you, to anoint your family with oil, to anoint your finances with oil, to anoint your marriage with oil, to anoint your teenagers. Yes, you're 13, 14. 14, 15 year olds with oil in the name of Jesus to anoint you, your family with oil in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God.